Good afternoon, Dr. Greer. Hello, Pat. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Good, good. Well, we're excited to give everyone an update. We've got a lot of questions yes. that have been coming in about the uh, uh, news story this week. Right. Um, earlier this week, the Department of Energy announced a monumental milestone in the nuclear fusion research, a net energy gain was achieved for the first time in history by scientists from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. So can you talk a little bit about your thoughts when you heard this and your thoughts mm -hmm. now that you've had a chance to kind of look into this a little more? Well, we have looked into it very carefully. And one of the things that uh, was not uh, focused on is uh, uh, some really key things about this. The net energy gain that they achieved was the equivalent of a 0.1 uh, kilowatt hour. So that's a, a tenth of a kilowatt for an hour, which is enough to boil a, a kettle of water. Um, they've spent three and a half billion dollars of our taxpayer money uh, from the Department of Energy at Lawrence Livermore. There have been five billion dollars spent on private fusion initiatives. Uh, this particular reaction, the one silver lining in it, is that scientifically they are claiming they got more energy out than in, so they are admitting and uh, what is called an over-unity result. Over-unity meaning you put in uh, one unit of power and you get out two or what have you. But in this case, the amount of gain was very, very small. It took a couple of hundred high-powered, high-energy lasers aimed at a pellet of tritium and deuterium, which are uh, radioactive isotopes, to smash them together. And when you see the headline that they got more energy out than in because of fusion, which is when uh, you know two atoms uh, fuse together, like in the sun or a hydrogen bomb, what they're leaving out is the enormous amount of energy it took to run these nearly 200 lasers. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a very deceptive, actually. And I would go close to calling this fraudulent because it's like you plugging in your electric car to a coal-fired grid and saying you're driving on free electricity because once you get the car running, it's not using any uh, electricity from the grid anymore. But of course it runs down and each time you have to then put in, uh, plug it in again and it's pulling energy out of a coal fired, gas fired, oil fired grid for 88% uh, of the energy that we use in our electric grid. So it's a very interesting announcement. <clears throat> now, I, I guess from a, a, a theoretical point of view, uh, they achieved a uh, fusion event um, which they have been searching for for a long time. But to claim that this is some kind of solution for a carbon-free energy future brings up a whole lot of issues. Number one, you can't discount to zero the amount of energy it takes to run the machine. So in this case, if you factor in the amount of energy it took to get those two atoms to fuse together, it was nowhere near over unity. It was nowhere near a net energy gain. It was a enormous 1,200 times, 1,200 times energy loss. So it took 1,200 times more energy from the lasers to create the ignition, they call it, and the fusion where they got this tiny gain. Now, in, I'm not sure in what universe they think that you would achieve that reaction without having to put energy into the system. Uh, I guess one could theoretically claim that once you got it going, it could become a chain reaction. The problem with that is the temperatures involved are 3 million degrees. In some of the private fusion experiments, they've been 300 million degrees. This brings up a big issue of safety. Who wants something that is that hot? operating somewhere, because if it were to have a breach, that amount of temperature would ignite the oxygen in the air. So you're getting into all kinds of technical issues beyond just the theoretical physics of, yes, we achieved fusion. But I want to remind people, a hydrogen bomb is a fusion reaction, 
Now, what do I mean? Hydrogen bombs, as opposed to atomic bombs, or, or hydrogen bombs are also called thermonuclear bombs. They usually use a small atomic bomb uh, to force fusion. Uh, and, and a tritium is also used in hydrogen bombs, nuclear warheads. And that then causes fusion that causes this explosive energy release known as a nuclear weapon. Now, in this case, they're doing it on such a small scale that they're not having an explosion. The question is, you know, causing that to be a routine source of energy is a, uh, or certainly facts that are not in evidence from a science point of view. The other question is the supply of uh, tritium. Uh, there's not much of it around. And it costs, uh, as I mentioned, uh, $850,000 a pound, $30,000 a gram. And there's about 28 grams in an ounce. All right. So, uh, excuse me, not a pound. So it's $850,000 for an, an ounce of the stuff. So a pound of it, we're talking millions and millions. So if you were to have these reactors all over the place, generating enough electricity, assuming you get into a true over unity reaction that continues, where is that coming from? How are you going to do that? Well, you can create tritium by bombarding lithium with uh, neutrons. And, but that's a very expensive process. That's why it costs $30,000 a gram. So when you're looking at an ounce of this stuff causing, costing nearly a million bucks and you're looking at 8 billion people and you're looking at the technical challenges and the temperatures involved in this, all of this, when for 100 years there have been low temperature plasma reactions, I've seen them, uh, and also electromagnetic systems like Tesla had that are pulling energy out of the quantum vacuum or zero point energy field resulting in a real over unity effect where you're getting much more power out than in. You know, the Floyd Sweet device, for example, that we are featuring in The Lost Century. And by the way, we really need everyone to go to thelostcenturyfilm.com and uh, contribute to that. We're about 57% uh, to our goal. Uh, I think in the next six weeks or so, we'll have the movie finished. And then by, we hope, May, late April or May, we're going to have it released. This movie is going to set the record straight on all of this. Uh, and our goal is that it is seen by at least uh, a billion people or so. The reason for it is that these sorts of announcements are suspect for their timing and their purpose. Uh, and let me get into this a little bit. Um, we, there's a history of when the truth begins to emerge on an issue, there are very powerful interests that want to pivot towards uh, an announcement that the whole media uh, covers and the globally and the scientific community that basically is gaslighting or distracting, diverting uh, people. Uh, and it's a little bit strange that this announcement comes after we presented what we did in Santa Monica in October and the plans that we have to release um, the information about these genuine uh, earth-saving technologies, uh, which are behind, by the way, how UAPs and UFOs operate. Uh, they're, they, you know, they don't have nuclear power plants on them and they're not burning jet fuel A or, or solid rockets. But there's no heat signature to them. And this has been confirmed by the Pentagon officially. So we're saying, uh, what I'm saying here is that there, there's something that is rather suspect about the timing of this announcement and the lockstep coverage without much. I mean, The Guardian and a few pa pa papers in Europe have questioned the legitimacy of this because they pointed out that the power needed to run those uh, nearly 200 lasers was not in the uh, uh, equation for it being uh, a net gain of power, which is, of course, ridiculous because the, the reaction didn't happen by itself. It cannot happen by itself. So then you get into this whole discussion of, 
why would, you know, as, as the National Security Agency people have told me, they set up things called DDT operations. And yes, it was a, a, a poisonous uh, uh, insecticide, but the purpose of, of a DDT in, in the intelligence community, it stands for you set up a decoy, you distract everyone's attention, and then you trash everyone's efforts to run down a rabbit hole and go into the weeds over here. It's a diversion. You just keep diverting people. But you see, we saw this happen before when the unacknowledged, the documentary that hit 760 million views around the world. Um, within a few months of that coming out, they stood up the TTSA and they stood up Elizondo and Chris Mill and other people that were had all the doors open to them in the mainstream media, everything from 60 Minutes on CBS to CNN everywhere else saying, Gee, you know, we don't know what these are. Maybe they're from China. All right. So that was a complete misdirect that the UFO community, the public, members of Congress, uh, people uh, in, in the media, they took that bait hook, line, and sinker. So my question here is is that's what's going on here, but preemptively? because uh, we're working with a number of people, whether or not it makes it into this documentary film or not is unclear, that uh, uh, apparently have systems that, that are operational, but they don't quite know how to kind of get it out there because of, they're afraid of repercussions or people have been known to disappear uh, or have problems when they begin to publicly acknowledge they have such a system. But, which is what we're doing this documentary, The Lost Century, for. And this is why everyone listening, you know, if, if a few hundred thousand people who will see this, if everyone went on there and, and just gave $5 it's a, at thelostcenturyfilm.com, we'd have enough to finish the film and also get a huge amount of information and publicity out about it when it comes out this spring. So we need your help. But I think that the other issue I have with this, Pat, is... When they announced this, uh, there was not enough people asking the hard questions that are in the fine print of the information that anyone, Google what I just said about tritium, what it costs, how rare it is, look into the question of whether this over unity, more power net gain than it took is true when they left out and I have not found yet how many, how much energy and power it was needed to run these nearly 200 uh, high-powered, high-energy lasers uh, to ignite this reaction with with the uh, with tritium. And uh, tritium, by the way, is H3. It's healing. It's hydrogen. It's uh, it's an isotope of of hydrogen, basically. It's called tritium. has three hydrogen. It's an isotope. So. The, that is something which you begin to question. If this is a, a legitimate scientific breakthrough, there should be an asterisk there because it's been known for decades since we first achieved fusion with, for hydrogen bombs that you could get a lot of energy out more than you would have to put in. That's why they're so destructive. I mean, this is why this is news to anyone, for example, most people don't know what a thermonuclear weapon is. And so they can gaslight the public and the media. Not many journalists are, are versed in physics and, and whatnot. So I want to be very clear about this. Uh, this is not the first time there's been a hydrogen fusion reaction. Tritium has been used in nuclear warheads. I mean, that's how you do a hydrogen bomb as opposed to an atomic bomb. Now, just to be clear, an atomic bomb, what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was a fission bomb where you split the atom. And when you split the atom, you get all this energy. This is fusion where you combine and collide uh, atoms and they fuse together, which releases even more power. That's why a hydrogen bomb or thermonuclear bomb is so much more destructive than an atomic bomb. But, that is something that was known science since the late 40s, early 50s, right? So in the early 50s, we detonated the first high hydrogen bomb, which was a fusion hydrogen bomb. Now, this obviously is not a bomb, thank God. They couldn't do that in a populated area, Lawrence Livermore Labs there in the, the Bay Area of San Francisco. 
uh, across the bay. But uh, it's not as if fusion hadn't been done before. And in this case, yes, they had a minor amount of excess power, but there's no indication that that can be replicated free of the amount of power it would take to start the ignition. And that that would actually then carry on to something that would be commercially available. For example, as we have pointed out, and we're pointing this out in this documentary, The Lost Century, there's 3 billion people who have no means of uh, electricity or gas to cook their food. That's why they're cutting down all the brush and rainforests and all over the world in these impoverished areas. So, you know, that's pushing half the world's population, almost uh, 40% or so. So then the question becomes, how are you going to get something this complex and potentially dangerous deployed all over the world to really fix the disappearance of, of the, the rainforest and to fix the whole climate issue and the global poverty issue? Now, our tax dollars have been dumped to the tune of three and a half billion dollars into this. Private investment has gone five billion into private fusion initiatives. And to give you an idea, I'm quite sure that if there was 100 million, so the, you know, this is like a hundred billion dollar project, uh, you know, in, in, where there should be a hundred million dollar solution, where you would basically bring in the scientists who understand the zero point quantum vacuum flux with these electromagnetic systems and also plasma systems, low temperature plasmas, a few thousand degrees, not millions. Uh, I was witness to one of these in Florida that uh, Professor Santilli had. I was also made aware of one in Salt Lake City that unfortunately was involved with a group who did not want to have it disclosed, but it was a plasma reactor that was filled up a closet area that had enough output to run all of the metropolitan area of Salt Lake City. No radiation, over unity, self-sustaining, et cetera. So given the fact that there is evidence and proofs that these systems have existed, are, why don't we have our government and also private investors give that area of research a chance rather than dumping tens of billions and you know and what's going on in china with the big international fusion reactor that has already consumed 22 billion dollars b billion so th this is something that's both from a policy point of view and a scientific point of view is very worrisome when an infinitesimal fraction of what's being spent on this fusion reactor research would give us a solution that would run everyone's house and car, but here's the big rub. Those solutions would preclude the giant industrial behemoths like General Electric and other big outfits of controlling the central power grid. This is a solution, if it were to ever work, that would empower massive multi-billion dollar facilities that is centralized with an electric distribution grid, the power lines, transmissions, that maintains the status quo of the economic global power of those who already have it. And this is a problem because huge swaths of Asia, India, Africa, Latin America don't have power lines to villages and poor areas. And it's trillions of dollars to build those power lines, never mind if the power plant, this fusion reactor would even work when there's a solution where you wouldn't need any power lines because your house and your car would have one of these systems pulling energy out of the zero point energy field. But see, that's why no one wants to support that because the big money knows that and the big government knows that in fact, if you were to support that, you're going to cause a complete winding down of the centralized power macroeconomic power, it's called globally, that is running the earth into the ground and is ensuring half the world's population is in poverty. So I think that this is something that has to be called out for what it is. It's very suspect. The timing of it is suspect. And I'm, I think that instead of trying to play catch up uh, from behind, like they did when Unacknowledged came out, they're trying to get ahead of the curve with this and try to say to the public, oh, gee, 
you know, now you don't need to worry. There's a real issue here psychologically because people see that headline. They go, oh, great. The global climate change and poverty issue is solved. There's no indication at all that this is a, is a solution for that. Um, but it would entice people, sort of like the electric car zeitgeist and solar and wind power, kind of lulled people until very recently into thinking, oh, well, now there's a solution. We don't need to, to, to think of anything else. Right. And, and so it, it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. Uh, pulling all the levers, creating this big distraction that, you know, keeps everyone focused over here. When if you pull the curtain back, you see that it's a, a very clever manipulation and deception. Now, some people say, well, that's rather cynical. I know it's how power and cartels and people operate. Uh, you know, this kind of, of deceptive uh, indication and warning, There's that's the name of these sort of operations at the Pentagon. So I think that we have to be uh, skeptical. It's fine to be hopeful. And the one good thing about it, they do admit that they got more energy out than in if you discount the lasers. But uh, and we can say, okay, so if you're admitting that's the case, why don't we do that with an electromagnetic system that doesn't have to be 3 million degrees? And why don't we do it with something that doesn't require tritium? that costs uh, $850,000 an ounce. Uh, so I think that you know, it, it's something that we have to skillfully explain to the public. And this, we are going to add a little bit of this in the lost century. But you know, that's, we're winding that production down, but it ain't over yet. I'm hoping it'll be completely finished by the end of January so it can be handed off for distribution, which takes two or three months to prepare. But I think that we can include this issue and I, the points that I'm making here. But I think the, the other issue in my mind is to what extent has this been designed to placate the public, to make them you know, sit back on their laurels? Because until very recently, that's what people were doing with solar and wind. And look, I'm a big advocate of anything besides something that you know, pollutes the air because I have a gigantic solar farm at my country house it's the largest legally allowed solar farm in Virginia. However, it won't run my house when the power goes out. It won't even heat it or cool it, even though it's the largest one allowed by law. So, you know, I, I'm willing to acknowledge it's better than nothing. And it's certainly better than burning wood or coal or oil or gas uh, or a nuclear reactor that creates a million years worth of, you know, cancer causing radioactive debris. But you know, we can do better than that. But I think that it's, there, there's a slippery slope here where people think, well, now that that has been solved, we don't need to search for or fund. So it, it sucks all the oxygen out of the room for alternative solutions that would be more practical and affordable and effective that would actually work uh, in time to actually save the biosphere. And uh, get us off this extinction level event path that that humanity is on right now. So I think all of these are big issues. You have to ask the question uh, because most people only read the headlines, Pat. You know, what I found is that here's the headline. I don't know how many people who see the headlines drill down on the physics and the technical reality of what's behind that headline. And this is why I'm doing this YouTube uh, expose of it because uh, anyone who wants to check the facts that I've just shared can check them and they're there for anyone to check who's a scientist or anyone in the lay public who can in, in understand this kind of technical information but I think the analysis that I want to bring to this is a much more specific one and that is when I see this sort of event happen I wonder if in fact there are some agendas unspoken as to why the timing of it and what they're trying to do with this, because uh, recently major uh, classically liberal journals like The Economist and scientific journals have been pointing out that it's been made very evident with the Ukraine war and uh, the Russia gas being cut off to Europe, that the most green countries in the world have no way of running their homes and factories and businesses with wind and solar, even if they put trillions of dollars. And to invest because there's not enough energy density, there's not enough 
battery storage capacity. I think there's something like globally uh, 75 seconds of energy uh, storage capacity in batteries uh, to, to run the needs of the planet. 75 seconds for the needs that we're actually consuming. So the lithium ion batteries that are used for that uh, don't have enough storage capacity. And of course, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day and the wind doesn't blow 24 hours a day. So you get into this real issue. How do you really move to a post-carbon, post-grimy, you know, coal, gas, oil, uh, nuclear power economy, all this dirty, destructive energy source? Uh, I don't think it's going to be a fusion reactor. It's going to be these technologies that no one is looking at. And the more there's a, a tension grabbing headline like this, the more it's going to pull people's attention away from what we're trying to expose and advocate for over to a non-solution solution. And that, I think, is exactly what I would think. If I was in the other position, if I was on the other side of this trying to figure out how do we basically pull attention away from what the Disclosure Project is doing and what we're doing with these new energy uh, revelations about zero point, what have you, how do we capture the media attention and the public attention, the government's attention, the Department of Energy, the, the Department of Energy secretary who made this announcement, Granholm, how do we get them to, to just ignore all this because we've got, quote, serious scientists who have proven that we have a hydrogen economy and, and uh, uh, free energy, non-polluting with carbon. I think it's actually very highly manipulative. Yeah, so and that they're that, target, uh, they've targeted, that's their market that they've targeted, right? The Congress, private investors, institutions, and the public. And the media, the media, the media and the public. So <clears throat> this is typical. They've done the same thing with the UFO secrecy for 70, 80 years. Um, I think that it's predictable. Uh, I would love it if an actual solution was revealed um, and supported. But when you drill down on this one, my concern is, and many physicists, by the way, I'm not the only person saying this, a lot of top physicists are saying exactly what I'm saying, uh, that it may or may not be, first of all, a reproducible experiment. No one's reproduced it yet. And of course, if you don't reproduce it, so what? And then the other is that there are scientists pointing out rather pointedly that the amount of energy it took to start that what they call ignition, this over unity reaction fusion was 1,200 times more than they got out. Well, <laughs> that's a big hill to climb. I mean, you can go to Ace Hardware and get a 90% electric generator, you know, or any you know, Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever. So, you know, you, you're getting into this question of, uh, when when you're, you have to, you know, put in 1,200 times more energy to get enough energy out to boil a, 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 a tea kettle of water, you have to go, well, you know, this is worrisome because is this a deliberate omission or how are they whistling past that graveyard? Uh, it, they're not presenting any solutions that would indicate that they can get around that start that energy needed to get the reaction going. This is why, you know, you have a little atomic bomb, very powerful, that ignites the fusion in a hydrogen bomb. It takes an enormous amount of energy to make that happen. You know, a star like the sun is a fusion reactor, but it's massive amounts of gravitational energy mm -hmm. that then squeeze and force the, 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 the atoms together that causes the amount of energy needed to ignite a fusion, and then start something like a star. So these are all known facts and science. You can look these things up. And I think that from a policy and strategic point of view, which is where I'm, where I'm always looking at this, is what is this really going to lead to? Is it going to really lead to a solution? Or is it going to suck up all the money and energy and attention uh, and make people feel they can sit back on their laurels that, oh, we have a solution now. Because I'm hearing from people who are 
very big supporters of the disclosure project who say, oh, well, maybe this is a great breakthrough. Now we have an energy solution because they didn't drill down on the data and the science behind the headlines. And that's why I think why I needed to urgently do this uh, YouTube analysis. Now, I hope it could be that someone figures out a way to pull this out of a $3 million or $300 million reaction to, to stumble across a plasma that is a few thousand degrees that can perpetually be running like the one that was up in Salt Lake City that they were keeping secret. It was kept secret after a four-star general got on the board of the organization and it went south from there, uh, not to be heard from again. But I think that is something that if, if it led to that, that'd be great. But I think that's what we need to sort of steer people towards. And I think the Lost Century uh, film that we're doing may be able to have to be able to turn that into a more productive, immediate solution not something that's many, many decades down the road that may never work. So I think we have to find a way to make lemonade out of the lemon here because this announcement is a bit of a lemon and I find it very suspicious. I can't imagine what kind of facility, what kind of mega facility this would be to house 200 lasers that use, I think in the Guardian, one scientist said that was 500 megajoules going in there, which is like 138 kilowatt hours i mean i just can't imagine it how big that and how many yeah. would you have to have to even i mean really to cover what part of the globe well yeah and they got enough energy out to 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 to, to uh, boil a tea kettle now in contrast there are physicists who have pointed out that the zero point energy field the amount of energy in the volume of space in a coffee mug your coffee mug go, go look at one the amount of space inside that mug has enough latent energy to boil off all the waters of the world if it was accessed. Now, of course, physicists will say, well, there's no way to access it. Well, that's not true. It's just been covered up and, and suppressed. People have accessed it, but those devices always meet a, a early demise because there are corrupt interests that suppress them, which is the dynamic we're trying to change. So I think that this is this whole discussion here, uh, everyone listening to this needs to share this YouTube link with everyone they know, and then share the link to the lostcenturyfilm.com because we need to actually do something to save humanity and the biosphere that's practical and isn't some sort of gaslighting of the public and the politicians and the scientific community and the media into, this, into the weeds of this thing. Uh, by the way, you can you can look up the size of this monstrosity at Lawrence Livermore Labs, and uh, also the uh, big uh, international uh, fusion reactor they're building uh, in China that they've already spent twenty two billion dollars on. A lot of that has been U.S. taxpayer money, by the way, um, and uh, they still don't have anything results from that reactor after dropping twenty two billion dollars into it. I would challenge people, give me less than 1% of that in an institute that we're, we want to form, and we would ha have a breakthrough that for every home and car and business in the world and every village in Africa and India would be a real solution. But you see, it seems like the things that are real solutions never get the support uh, because, and, and make note here, Tens of billions of dollars have gone into this hydrogen fusion research from government and private. I mentioned five billion private dollars have gone in. Why don't those same people just throw some tiny fraction of that in the direction of new energy research that's electromagnetic, the quantum vacuum flux, zero point, uh, hydrogen from the water, you know, like Stan Meyer's uh, system or Walter Jenkins system. Why don't, why don't, why doesn't that happen? And it would take nowhere near the tens of billions that have gone in uh, to these other uh, boondoggles in physics. I, I, one of the things I thought of when I read the article uh, and how much personnel and years of research, uh, decades uh, and money, it reminds me of a friend of, of the Disclosure Project that I worked with back in the 90s who was a NASA 
research scientist, Dr. Richard Haynes, he says, oh yes. He says, we consider ourselves white collar welfare. That's why I wore my white shirt. Uh, white collar welfare, basically, it's these make work products, you know, look, you know, look busy and do this and that. And, you know, they make these great salaries and pensions and everything. But that's what Dr. Haynes called what he and his colleagues were doing, white collar welfare. I thought it was hilarious uh, when he used that expression. I had never heard it. But this, this reminds me a little bit of that. It's sort of like uh, a huge make work project that the people who are supporting it know it's never going to go anywhere. A lot of them know. I think some of them don't. A lot of them are very hopeful, um, but they're not educated. What we need to do is be sure they get educated on these other alternatives that are much more practical, for which there's a great deal of body of evidence, a huge body of evidence that they've existed in the past, um, and that a, a, a small amount of support. I mean, we're not asking for you know 22 billion like the Chinese uh, fusion reactor or the three and a half billion dollars that went into this Lawrence Livermore project uh, and, and, and give us a chance. Let's give the, the inventors and the research community dealing with uh, these electromagnetic field uh, energy systems and, and low temperature, 3000 degree or so plasma systems uh, of several of, of which I've known about a chance and do it in an open source scientific way so that the whole world sees what's happening transparently. The results are dispersed transparently. People can reproduce them. I predict in a couple of years, not in 20 or 30, we'd have massive breakthroughs and the world's uh, uh, fortunes in terms of the future of, the, of humanity and the earth being healed of the damage we've done to it would, would be a, a totally different story than the very long trajectory, if it works at all, or this fusion reactor business. All right, and the money. Right. They talked about the, um, they were talking about the scientists that are working with the goal of a multinational, multi-billion dollar project called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, which is under construction in Southern France now. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, you well, know, there, they, there's one in France, there's one in China. They're, they're doing this all over, but it's, it's, an, it's, it's you know, tens of billions of dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the DOE just said that they, in September they had made an investment of fifty million dollars for public-private partnership for the fusion pilot plant designs. That's for the plant designs, and I I doubt that's for the building of it. <laughs> just really yeah, guess. exactly. Well, see, with that amount, we would be able to have an open source lab. Open source meaning everything being transmitted to the public. Any breakthroughs given freely to the scientific community and engineers around the world to prove or disprove. Um, you know, one of the things that I keep saying to any of you inventors out there working on these systems, uh, I'm, I'm going to a meeting uh, next week with some people who have these systems. I can't say where or who, because they want to be very hush-hush at this stage. But you don't try to make a product to sell before before you've done the scientific work and had it disclosed in a way that people who are quote skilled in the art of electrical engineering or whatever can prove it. Because when you're talking about the one thing I always agree with Carl Sagan on extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You cannot, no one's going to take the word of an inventor and the little business, you know, that they have around them that this works. It has to be proven. It has to be tested independently. It has to be a, at least a version of it. it has to be open sourced so that any skeptical, not debunker, but a skeptical scientist can go, let me test this. Let us build this up from the plans that these guys have and let us test it and see if in fact it's putting out more energy than it has to go into it. And, and let us check the facts on this, because if you don't do that, the public, the politicians, the media, and most importantly, the scientific community isn't going to believe it. Because while there are corrupt scientists and there are corrupt politicians, most of them are not. There's not like there's some vast conspiracy where everyone is in on this. 
but they need to see something more than the assertions and claims of the stakeholders, the investors and the inventor. And this is something I've never yet been able to convince uh, uh, an inventor or scientific team to do. They all treat it as if we got to keep this so secret, no one knows how it works. And we're going to just suddenly go from that to selling a product. I'm going, no, you cannot. You got to do this scientific process and disclose it just transparently, honestly, and let people test it. But that not only verifies it, which is very important when you're dealing with a radical claim like this, an over unity, more energy out than in claim, uh, which is many people say not possible due to the laws of thermodynamics, which is a false statement because what they're not factoring in is the amount of latent energy in the zero point quantum vacuum, which as I said, the volume of space in the coffee mug you have over there would, would, is enough energy to boil off all the uh, oceans of the planet, never mind you know, heat a tea kettle. So I think that this is why we're advocating a, a, a process where we get one system that actually is over unity, closed loop, meaning the output runs the input and it's there running, putting out energy because it continuously is tapping into this latent field of energy that is all around us, what Tesla called the infinite energy field. Um, and I think that if that were to happen, it doesn't preclude later that same group or scientists or, or group of investors to then create a product that could be sold at your local hardware store or online. It just means that it would establish it as a bona fide area of science. It would prove it. But most importantly, it would disclose it to the masses. What I would want to do, if I got one of these today, tonight, I would contact everyone I know who has a million or more or 100 million followers on social media and get them to send out to their followers the plans, the information. And then the first 20 of them we build I would have it running their house and car because if, even if the corrupt media gets a phone call from the CIA saying, do not cover this. If you have a couple of billion people through a lot of these celebrities and influencers dropping links to it, then, you know, the cat's out of the bag. And that's our strategy. It's a very important thing that people understand. It's a strategy that would go make a workaround. Uh, the, the embargo on information that the media and government and suppression has been able to do. And we've studied uh, now for almost 30 years how they've done it, why they've done it, and what the mechanisms are. And that knowledge, which we'll present in, in the Lost Century uh, film, uh, informs this strategy I'm describing now. So this would be my other challenge to those listening. And if you're concerned about the environment and energy, and poverty, you should help us organize people who can fund this research and development lab to do exactly that and to take this to the next level where it would be really done transparently and scientifically. Because, you know, as a doctor, if someone were to come to me and say, I have a new treatment for leukemia, and, but it's a secret. <laughs> Nobody can know what it is. Nobody can know how it works. But, but here it's, you know, $50,000 a dose. Will you give it to your patient? I said, no. <laughs> you know, and, and so this is, you know, people who are these inventors and engineers and these sort of small investment groups that build up around them, they need to kind of learn a little bit that this isn't how you make a new industry and a new area of science or a new breakthrough in science. Because that's just as ludicrous. No one's going to take the word of the advocate who stands to profit millions or billions of dollars and just say, yeah, I'm going to take your word for it. Um, it's, no scientific breakthrough has ever advanced that way. It has to be released to people in a way that people can verify it, recreate it, reproduce it, and say, yeah, this is real. And I, I speak of this because I know in academia, the opposite sometimes happens. <clears throat> I have a family member who shall remain unnamed, 
who is in a very top drawer PhD program. And the principal investigator under which this person was doing their uh, PhD was found to have falsified all the data that resulted in this person being a tenured professor at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And uh, this family member kind of blew the whistle on it and almost cost that person their entire career. But this happens in academia too, where you know people don't check the facts and don't check the uh, reality. It happens in medicine, it happens in physics, it happens, in, there's junk science all over the place. So because of that, the people are, are right to be skeptical. Now they need to be skeptical of the claims about this fusion reactor and look into the facts I have just shared, but anyone who claims they have a quote free energy device or an over unity energy device, it's electromagnetic or plasma or water, they need to be able to say, here, here is a, it, it may, may not be the, th the state of the art of what they have, but it needs to be a proof of principle system that can be tested, verified, published, put out to the public. Now, because this is an area of science that I don't think any mainstream physics journal will touch, uh, because those are also tend to be very hidebound and skeptical, it just needs to be put out publicly in a large enough way that enough engineers, scientists, and academic institutions begin to go, oh, well, let us try this. And they put it together, and voila, if it works, you're not gonna be able to silence thousands of people who have reproduced that effect. You can't, because it's either gonna work or it doesn't. So I, I strongly recommend that anyone listening to this YouTube who knows someone or themselves may have what a system, think about what I'm sharing and get in touch with us through our website, uh, seriousdisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S disclosure.com, all one word. And there's a box there to contact me and, you know, a contact box and, and let us know what you have and we can discuss this. I think there's a way of doing it where in this first phase, you open source it, you put it out, you educate the public. Um, and then in the second phase, that doesn't preclude that group moving with something maybe they have uh, in the back room that may be more developed if they're wanting to be paranoid and be concerned about money. Uh, my concern is not money. My concern is the future of the planet and, and strategy and science. But I understand people who put millions of dollars into their research don't want to lose all that either. So I think that there is a way to do it that we need to find a way that uh, satisfies those needs. Um, but ultimately, it's not going to go anywhere, A, if it's not scientifically verified, and B, if it's not disclosed to hundreds of millions or a billion or two people, because a, some, a breakthrough this big is so disruptive to the status quo of the big money, the big monkeys with their big money piles and how they control the global economy. Any entity that tries to do this and with any other strategy is going to be smashed and smushed like a wormy apple. They are going to go nowhere with it. And the reason I can say that emphatically is that if you do a study of the last hundred years, that is what has happened to every single one of these systems. Because none of them have done the scientific, transparent, open source scientific release of some iteration or version of what they have so that it could have gone viral and become newsworthy and gotten to a lot of people. Now, before the last few years, and before the internet, there was no way to get the news of something like this to a billion people. Now there is, because there are so many people interested in the environment, poverty, climate change, energy. Uh, if you were to release something like this and you had some prime movers who are celebrities and people with enormous social media following, much bigger than mine, for example, um, then you're going to be able to put something out there that will be uh, really have momentum and won't be stoppable and won't be able to be suppressed. It can't be suppressed. One of the things I always point out to these scientists, you've, by keeping it secret in a small group, you've painted a big bullseye on your back because you're the sole holders of that knowledge. And if you do that, 
you're making your, your security, if you're going to look at it, SecOps, security ops operations and protocols, you have done the worst fatal mistake possible to make your group and yourself vulnerable to these attacks. So it doesn't make sense strategically at all to behave that way. It's so counterproductive, but it's also counterintuitive from what most small businesses and venture capital groups and technology groups do. They are trained to keep things very secret. They don't want competitors to know. They behave as if they're dealing with a better software program or a, a better uh, computer circuit or something, but they're not. They're dealing with something that is so disruptive to the status quo of the power players on the planet that they have no idea that the buzzsaw that they're going to step into is going to chew them up. And there's a way around it, but it's a very specific pathway. And that's what we're trying to advocate. Right. Quite a heavy lift there. <laughs> it can be done. I, you know, I'm convinced it can be done. I, I think it's actually not difficult. Often the real uh, genius in a plan is its utter simplicity and unexpected. It's an unexpected way that you, no one would think you would do this. Uh, but if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, making all the mistakes that have been made from the 20s till now, over 100 years, you, you're, you're, you are nuts, insane, if you think you're going to get a different result. You're not going to get a re different result. So I would uh, plead with anyone listening who may have one of these systems or know someone who does to think about this and think that, that you can do uh, very well by doing good and there's a pathway but you need to understand the strategic uh, world that you're in. You're, if you, you've got a tiger by the tail, if you've got something that's legitimately over unity and not some you know, $100 billion boondoggle like this fusion reactor business, um, because it is so disruptive. Uh, now, it has to be disruptive. We don't have 100 years to dither away. Like the last 100 years, the Earth and, and the population of the Earth, more importantly, uh, long before I think we would run out of fossil fuels, we're going to run out of uh, the Earth being able to tolerate this level of abuse, but also the, the disparity between the wealthy, rich countries and the poor. I mean, that's a, that's a time bomb ready to explode when you have 3 billion people who are scrounging around for wood to make charcoal to cook their food. And they don't even have gas or electricity at all. And we're talking about these fusion reactors. I mean, it, it's, there's a major disconnect uh, that isn't compassionate. I mean, you know, think of the poor people. I mean, imagine we were lucky we were born how we were born. But what if you were born in, in one of these impoverished areas um, and your, your prospects are nil and, and announcing that there's a you know, trillion dollar fusion reactor that maybe you could get hooked up into at some point. It's almost a cruel joke to half the world's population, actually. So I look at this from many perspectives, technical, scientific, strategic, humanitarian. And I, my plea to people is, you know, why don't we give this approach a chance? So all the other approaches have been tried and failed. You know, you know Stan Meyer keeping his secret and then falsifying the patent so no one could recreate it so no one could steal it from him and then he was he's dead i mean i've seen this story play out so many times even in my career of the last 30 years um that you know at a certain point you go gee you know how many times do you have to keep banging your head against that wall before you get half a clue that that ain't gonna work it isn't gonna work uh, i think one of the problems is there's no institutional memory and by that i mean Everyone who comes across this, they don't know the history of what's going on before them. And since they don't know that, they end up making the same mistakes. That's another thing that I hope that the Lost Century film can remedy. Because people who see it, who are working on these solutions or may have one in their business or garage or what have you, will go, ah, this is what I was planning to do. And they will see the predictable things that others have done that have failed and why they failed. It's very, you know, it's a logical analysis. And I'm hoping that it'll have that effect even for the inventor community and the engineering community that are pursuing these solutions. That would be great. Yeah. That'd be yeah. good. 
So there's a lot of good, that, a great deal of good that can come from the Law Century. So I uh, hope you guys will all support that by going to thelawcenturyfilm.com. And, and there are incentive gifts, you know, there are uh, about a dozen different incentive gifts for different levels of, of giving. And, um, you know, it'll be put to extremely good use. None of it goes to me, per se. It goes to the production and to the getting the word out, and marketing of it. And hopefully at that point, you know, if, if we can reach numbers beyond what unacknowledged and close encounters of the fifth kind reached, uh, it will have a huge effect in potentiating and giving power to this direction, these solutions. Right. The ones that's, that our, that's our goal. Rather than mega centralized ones, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Greer. Thank you. And thank everyone thank you uh, who's, who's listening for supporting what we're doing. And uh, we'll keep you informed as this uh, develops further. Yes, and thank you for explaining this. I know this is something that most of us really do not understand because most of us are not physicists or scientists. So right. thank you so much for this. We appreciate You're it. You're welcome. And have a happy holiday, everybody. Thank you. You too, thank Dr. You. All right. Bye-bye.